Stuart Farrer practice witchcraft, and tonight they are open to question. O Queen of the Sun, Queen of the Stars, bless this wine unto our bodies. As the athame is to the male, so the cup is to the female, and conjoined they become one in truth. Witchcraft normally conjures up the image of dark satanic rites. However, these modern witches claim that they are following an ancient religion believed by pagans and the druids. They argue that the psychic power which they generate through spells and rituals is neither good nor evil. It is the witch's intention alone which determines whether the power is used for white or for black magic. But how much strength do the witch's spells really carry, if any at all? Is witchcraft an old religion or just another cult? or indeed just a big con. Janet and Stuart live in Ireland, where they hold regular covens and have together written several books on witchcraft. Janet and Stuart, you've brought along a variety of your implements for us here today. I wonder if we could perhaps start the programme with you as explaining to us just exactly what these various items do. OK, let's start with the athemi. This is the traditional witch's weapon. It is never used to draw blood because there is no blood sacrifice whatsoever in witchcraft. It represents the male principle of creation. And along with this, which is the female principle of creation, if you like, it's the phallus and the womb. United together, it is the union of man and woman. So this is used for symbolic sex? It's one of the reasons it's used. The other is that we work in a portable church or temple, which we call a magic circle. There's nothing mysterious about a magic circle, and we use this to inscribe that circle, which is setting up our working place. Well, Stuart, could you perhaps then explain to us what the ram's horns are used for? Yes, well, this is my ritual crown, and Janet has one there. Um, hers is Luna. But <coughs> this represents the principle of nature. You know, the... Um, People look at that and think, hello, he's wearing the devil's horns and so on. But the idea of the devil wearing horns is quite a new one. Throughout the Old Testament, horns are a sign of God-given power. And that, that's what they were a symbol of. In fact, there is a statue of Moses wearing horns somewhere in the Vatican. And so, during our rituals, I mean, I as a uh, high priest would represent the male principle and Janet the female principle, and that's why she's got a moon on the front of hers, because the moon is the primary goddess symbol, if you like. Now, we've had quite a lot of questions then from the audience as to how you actually became uh, witches in the first place. The first question coming from Julie Bacon. Were you recruited into witchcraft, or did you discover it for yourselves? Well, I came to it by doing exactly what John's doing now, by interviewing some witches. I was a journalist at the time, and I was sent along to interview some. And um, I became interested and uh, took it from there. And Janet will tell you how she met them. And we, that is where we met at that particular coven. Recruiting is something you don't find in witchcraft at all. It is totally alien to our religion. Um, we don't go out seeking converts. If we had, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Because I went along because a friend of mine was very interested. I grew up in a very, very strict Christian family. Church every Sunday. Uh, my grandfather was um, an elder of the church, and my father was still alive. He still lives with us now and is still a practicing Christian. He had the attitude that if your friend's getting involved in this, keep an eye on her. There's something funny about this. So I went along to keep an eye on her. I was so impressed by what I saw, the way the people conducted themselves, their code of philosophy, their moral code, and their spiritual code, that I stayed and became a witch myself. Now, a lot of people want to know exactly what your powers are now that you are both witches, uh, Scott Patterson especially. Although you claim not to be Satanists and are opposed to harmful magic, would you not say that the source of white and black magic is basically the same? Well, if you're going to say that God does it, then your answer would be yes, because quite honestly, the power that witches use is the power of God. Everybody can harness the power of God. Jesus himself said, go out and heal the sick. This power from God is the divine power of the universe. 
This is why when you join a coven, you are taught this very strict moral code. The first law of the craft is, and it harm nobody whatsoever, do what you will. Do you want to come back in? Yeah. Uh, how can you say your, your religion is basically, am I right in saying you're saying your religion is basically the same as Christianity and that your power is from God? All genuine religions gain their power from God, whether you're a Jew, a Muslim, a pagan, because, for example, a lot of the world are pagans. In Iceland, it is the equal state religion alongside Christianity. Our religion is very close in many ways to the Hindu religion. Christian Gurumathi. Um, Alistair Crowley was one of the earliest white witches, and he said, do no. what thou wilt. Alistair do you Crowley agree was this? not a witch. Let's get this right. Alistair Crowley was a ritual magician. He did not follow, follow the path of the old religion at all. Well, he was called the Great Beast, and he lived by those, and he founded a lot of the... I know. He, he loved sending people up. up. He loved shocking people. And um, you cannot take him, certainly, as an example of, of witchcraft. In fact, the craft wouldn't have him. When he no. tried to become a witch, the craft said, we're not having the likes of you. Yes. And you're quoted as having said that you worship the same creative being as Christians. There is only who, one creative who being. Who is God, and yet God clearly decla uh, declares in his word that he's totally opposed to witchcraft and casting of spells. Ah, yeah, I don't no, know. Where does he say that? Let's get uh, this quote right. He says it in Num Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Well, to begin with, certainly we would not do any sacrifices. Yeah, you said that. Uh, I've got except that one. Yes, we do practice divination. Yes. Um, I think at the time, quite honestly, that was the, the Hebrew priesthood um, not wanting any competition. And let's quite face honestly. it, the Old Testament is one of the most beautiful b uh, pieces of Hebraic wisdom. Amongst the Hebrews, their own prophets and prophetesses practiced exactly that which is being condemned there. Divination. Think about that. They practiced divination. Yes. Prophecy, uh, prophecy is divination. Let's, it's exactly the same thing. Let's look at some of the other further powers that you, that you claim to have. Paul Harkins. Have you ever cast a spell on someone you didn't like? No, this again mm. is that old law of the craft that you must never harm another human being ever under any circumstances. Yeah. And it's, it's not something you find witches doing. Yes. Do you not feel it dangerous that the power that, that you have, whether it be from God or from nature, is in the hands of human beings who can use it for selfish motives? So you can the power of your muscles. You can wring someone's and you can throttle somebody. Mm -hmm. But do you not feel it dangerous that the psychic power, whatever power you get from nature, is dangerous? It is dangerous if you misuse it. All the, hum all the powers that uh, God has given human beings are dangerous if misused. Yes, Robert. Well, I was going to say, we've got a lot of suspicion here about the misuse of it. How would you allay these suspicions, and how, in effect, would you try and wipe out black magic? Well, wiping out black magic I'll come on to in a minute, but as far as allaying suspicion, it's something that is not easily done. But if somebody gave you a treasure, a beautiful, wonderful treasure, would you abuse that treasure? Would you despoil it? Because that is what your psychic power is. The majority of a witch's work is used for healing. The greatest reward any witch can have is to watch somebody who has been very, very ill begin to recover. And this is the proper use of psychic power. And the majority of the witch's work is exactly this. Yes. Are you still developing your psychic powers and when, when will they be fully developed? When they are fully developed, we will not be living on this planet any longer. We will re have returned to the, the cosmic order. God, call it what you will. Victoria Hind. Do, do you find that black witches tried to persecute you? And if so, can you give some examples? There aren't many black witches. There are people who study the occult and who are out for selfish ends. These usually belong to a different kind of occult order, which is why inside the craft we have our own, what we call the psychic police force. We keep a check on these kind of people. And if we find they're stepping outside the law, it's the witches who'll be straight down the police station saying, excuse me, but something's got to be done about this. Yes. Uh, do you not feel ridiculous working sky clad or naked <laughs> and cold? Well, let's put it this way. We don't when it's very cold. We do wear robes as well. But a lot of people misunderstand this ritual nudity. Um, there's another biblical quote. Unless ye be as little children, in no way may ye enter the, the kingdom of heaven. Why do you quote you the Bible be so much? Quite, do you, do because you take it as a witch foundation? is a student of many world religions. The Bible, because we're talking to most of you who are Christians, is the easiest to use. 
and there are some very, very quotable parts from the Bible. Yes. In the Great Rite, you practice not only symbolic but actual sexual intercourse with your working partner, um, could, ir ir irrespective of um, your relationship. No. no. No, you are wrong no. there. The Great Rite is practiced at the end of every ritual in a symbolic form by putting a knife into a chalice full of wine and blessing the wine. If it is done in actuality, it is done entirely privately between the couple concerned. This couple preferably should be a, a happily married couple inside the craft or established lovers with each other who are you know, planning to get married. It is not done between odd individuals. The whole key to the great rite is that you must love each other. You must be in love and love each other. It is also used for the procreation of witchcraft children. We don't believe that God can't see under the covers. So um, a witch couple wanting a baby would do it in their sacred temple, but always in private, never with people watching. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, I didn't mean like in public, you know, mm. I did. But what I was um, thinking of was, is it possible for incest to be committed without you actually realising that? Incest? Between yes, what? Sir. Between brother no, and sister no, and no. child. Your working partner states that it can be uh, either um, father and daughter or brother yes, and sister. Yes, I see where the misunderstanding has come. Um, in this case, if a father and, daughter, father and daughter or, or mother and son were working, they wouldn't participate <coughs> in the great right. Then this surely they're missing out something in there. No, in because the um, then what you'd find would happen is that when the, the child was old enough and they had their own boyfriend or girlfriend, um, if it was a person in the craft, yes, they would partake of the great so, right broadly then. Broadly speaking, you're recognising Christian mor morality in that you oppose incest and you're talking about the prefer preferability of uh, lovemaking occurring between a married couple. That yes, sounds very conventional. Exactly. Yes, but exactly. Witchcraft is very this is conventional. This is, again, a misunderstanding. I think this is more than just Christian morality. I mean, it is normal human morality that um, sex is a relationship which is part of a total relationship. And if it, if it isn't, then it is, there's something slightly shabby about it. Yes. Mm. Janet, in past lives, you see you were a Spanish whore and a Roman slave. Is this just a subservient fantasy? We're going back to the role of psychiatry again. Um, reincarnation is a fascinating subject. Um, those, that one, for example, is one of the more dramatic ones. But other times, I mean, I've just been ordinary Joe blogs in the street. Um, How do you know? Again, reincarnation recall. And again, a lot of it goes right back even to my childhood. Did you know that the majority of the world religions, in fact, about two thirds of the world's uh, population believe in reincarnation? And again, it is something that's been investigated scientifically. Back row. If your religion uh, or your craft doesn't believe in heaven or hell, but you do believe in reincarnation, where do you believe that the spirit goes in between these things? We call it the Summerlands, which is a very, very pleasant place. Um, again, although we don't draw back the dead, sometimes I have helped people over between their physical life and you know, their spirit leaving their body, so I have glimpsed the Summerlands. It is the nearest to, if you like, the way the human uh, mind can conceive of paradise. But the ultimate is even more wonderful than that. Sheila Dix. Do you have any choice of the future reincarnation that you may encounter? It, it depends on how you have developed, you know, and what are the next lessons you need to learn. Um, how it happens, uh, you know, people would hold different views, but... Uh, it seems as though someone up there, if you like, is seeing to it that you get the, the sort of life next that you need for the lessons you've got Have to learn. Have you been discontented with one of the lives that you've had? Yes, when I was a Spanish whore. I mean, that sounds glamorous, but you think about it. Living in the 16th <coughs> century in extreme poverty, with a, a, a small daughter and no husband, Will you and having that's to sell yourself, that's not glamorous, it's horrible. Will you always be human beings in each reincarnation? Yes. Hmm. Yes. yes. Robert Hickman. Will there always be witches in each reincarnation? Not necessarily. No. Yeah. Will you always meet each other in each reincarnation? Certain people, yes, you do come across time and time again. <coughs> yes. No, no, yes, do you want to come in? Yeah. You said um, that you may not always be witches, but um, will you always possess the powers that you... Like, you talk about the astral plane, you say people don't understand. Well, that's true, because I don't really understand at all. But these psychic powers, will you always possess these, even if you Everybody don't come back as a, as a witch? And one, one hopes that, uh, you know, <coughs> if in one life you've made, pra made progress in developing them, then you are likely to be more psychically gifted in the next life, you know. Yes. 
If you have all these special powers, why then do you need a martial arts expert as a bodyguard? For surely forewarned is forearmed. <coughs> we live in a real practical world. And by living in that real practical world, we have to face the fact that out there can be a very dangerous place sometimes. Because of the fact that, for example, I'm a known witch, I often have to go into places where, and I hope I'm not going to offend anybody in the audience, for example, there may be some fundamentalists or born-again Christians. I know of at least one Christian organization in England who are so militant that they have actually stooped to violence, physical violence, not just against witches, <coughs> but against anyone of any other religion as well, and this isn't funny. Yes. What do you think inspires this extremism against you? Surely this goes back to the whole idea of them being so suspicious of you. You've got to do something about allaying this I suspicion. Think it, it Which is why we do programmes like this. It, it goes back partly to the persecution centuries, you know, and that was in a time where it was accepted that everyone of any given state had to be of the same religion. And the persecution centuries, are roughly from the sort of 15th to the 18th, um, the church was determined to stamp out paganism and uh, our kind of religion, if you like to put it that <coughs> way. And so they branded it with all sorts of uh, horrible propaganda, including the idea that we worship Satan and so on. And when the persecution died out, um, this sort of fairy tale image remained. And it hasn't just happened to us, has it? I mean, it happened to the Jewish people as well. Yeah. They Victor suffered the same way. Victoria Hind. Do you find that uh, people who live near you, your neighbours and so forth, act over-friendly towards you as if they're trying to keep on good terms? No, just ordinary average people living ordinary average lives. They don't overplay it one way or another. And they're not, they're not scared of you? Not in the least. In fact, they pull our legs about it. Yes. But why do you use the term witch? I mean, you use enough other euphemisms. Um, surely witch, that word... Um, arouses suspicion and fear in many people? I'll confess to you that there has been some discussion inside the craft about this, should we use this name. <coughs> but the point is that this was the name which was used even before the persecution days, or its earlier equivalent, you know, Wicca, Wicca, and it meant the wise people. And um, we feel that we should rehabilitate the image. Why, why be ashamed of it? And anyhow, it's too late now because the revival movement started 30 or 40 years ago and we're stuck with the name and to withdraw from it now would be an apology. Yes. Can you do anything to destroy the stereotypes which are held in society about witches, like the good witch of the north or the wicked witch of the west? Oh, I think they're lovely. <laughs> All our, everyone has these archetypes in the back of their mind. and. Um, over the years, it's changing so fast. I think by the year 2000, considering the growth of the craft throughout the world, even over the last 50 years, it's going to be much more a household word. I can almost say with a, with a definite certainty that even out of this audience, at least one person, by the time they are 30 years old, will be studying the magical arts in one form or another. In fact, you probably all know a pagan or a witch somewhere or a magician who lives quite close to you and you would never even guess what they are. Yes, the back row, in blue. Would you identify your religion today with the Canaanite worship of Baal and Ashtaroth from biblical times? Again, you're talking of names like Baal, Ashtaroth, etc. These are just names. Well, this is um, two of the male and female principles that yes, you've been speaking Yes, again, of. Baal, remember, just meant Lord. To the Hebrews, the word Baal meant Lord. It was a name, a title. You mustn't forget that in the Hebrew religion, God the Father, in other words, Jehovah, had many, many names. And these names meant something very special to the Hebrews. And amongst his names, Baal actually was one of them. He wasn't a different god, he was exactly the same person. I would disagree because... Have you studied Hebrew Hebrewism, the Hebraic religion? I wouldn't claim to be a historical expert, but for the sake of argument, a contest between Elijah and the 450 priests of Baal, they all seem to be in direct opposition, but now it seems to be a softer message coming across for media consumption, that it's one and the same, the same creative well, being. I, I, I couldn't accept I that. Think, I think we want to avoid getting too bogged down in, in, in Old Testament philosophy. A, a lot of the questions we've been getting in, however, are, are, a, bit, uh, are a bit cynical. Uh, one from Kristen Gurumurthy. Mr. Farrah, in your role as a dramatist, uh, you obviously had to have a very vivid imagination. Do you not think it's possible that this vivid imagination has just run away with you to the extent that you believe you're <laughs> a witch now? 
<laughs> I do, um, any wise witch will be very careful about this. Um, you try to use imagination constructively if you want to achieve an end, uh, what people generally call spells, you know, which are trying to uh, bring about a given result psychically. There's a combination of imagination and willpower. You know, visualizing what you want and so on, and then applying your willpower to it. But you have to be, you have to leave, in fact, in my coven, I've got the reputation of being the yes but man, of uh, always saying, no, this can be explained on such and such grounds. You do have to be very careful not to let your imagination run away with you. You always have to be um, looking under the carpet to see if there's a different Do you want to come um, back in? I was just going to say Sorry. one thing to you on yes. that also. When you look at the kind of professions that witches come from, they don't come from over-imaginative professions. All right, Stuart's a writer. Doctors scientists, marine biologists, um, the computer, people involved in computer work, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Do, do, do you want to come back? Many people would just say that you were mad and that you couldn't earn a living with a decent job, so you're just exploiting people by making them clutch onto but things look, that they I, can't uh, make. So why don't you disprove us all now by just conducting a spell here in the studio for everybody to see instead no, of keeping this, it secret This, this is a, a thing that people are always asking, instant magic, you know, doing <coughs> sort of conjuring in public. It doesn't work that way. If you want to produce an effect, it requires uh, concentration. It requires a certain amount of quiet to get your thoughts in order. It may re require working in a group. But anyone who produces... Uh, instant magic in front of an audience to demand, I would be very suspicious of, and I would look for the aces up his sleeve. Well, that's a very convenient answer, isn't it, really? It's it is the true answer. answer. In it other words, it, 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 would, it will always be impossible for you to reach a mass audience by proving to them once and for all that you aren't frauds, but are, are, gen are genuinely if able to conduct magic. If I wanted to, to conv magic. convince our friend here, the way to do it would be to sit down in our home and go through the co our coven records for the 17 years we've been working and saying that's what we did then, that one worked, that one worked, and this is how it worked, and you can go and answer, that one didn't work, and so on. And we would say, not that it's successful all the time, but statistically that our successes are very, very far above France. Yes. That's all we would claim. Yes. What is the most amazing thing you've ever done? The most amazing thing? Um, I think um, our friend Mara. <coughs> yes. Um, you may have seen in the newspapers that uh, a few years ago, in October, there was a massacre of seal pups on Inishkay um, Islands off the northwest coast of, of Ireland. And uh, it was done by local fishermen who claimed that they were ruining their nets. There was a big public outcry in Ireland, and a lot of volunteers the next pupping season went and camped there to try to, to make sure it didn't happen again. We would have liked to join him, but we couldn't. And so we tried to work a spell. We tried to set up, as a coven, tried to set up a thought form to protect these, um, these seal pups. Uh, we called her Mara, and, uh, which means of the sea in Gaelic, as they say over there in Gaelic. Um, and uh, Janet painted a picture of us. So we all had her in our minds. And uh, we put all the power we could into that. We were talking a um, few months later, after the pupping season, to a couple of uh, volunteers who'd been out there. They didn't know what we'd done. <coughs> and they were saying how they were delivering um, supplies to the volunteers in very, very bad weather, and they wanted to go ashore. And they saw a woman um, waving them off from where they were going to land, <coughs> urgently. And so they went a little further and landed safely. And they were told there could not have been a woman there anyway. It was, it was just impossible. And her description fitted Janet's painting exactly in our image. And we learned later that um, this figure was quite often seen among the seal pups and was known as the ghost to the volunteers. So there's something we set up. And this particular volunteer system. happens to be studying at Trinity College in Dublin, and he is a physicist. Yes. When you, uh, you talked about stopping seal clubbers, you could <coughs> construe that as a political act, in which case are you a socialist witches or like Mrs. Thatcher well, we, who we magically disappears We find that, that witches are of every shade of politics, but there's one soapbox that they have in common and that's the ecological environmental one because it's very much a nature based religion. We feel very strongly about responsibility for Mother Earth and her creatures yes. and that, that particular political point, if you like, they would all share in common. Yes, back row. If there's uh, scientists and doctors among your ranks, how does science as a whole view your craft? 
do they accept it or do they totally reject Depends it? Depends entirely being on the individual. Silly? I think a lot of progressive scientists realise that psychic powers do exist and are being scientifically investigated, and a lot of doctors and nurses feel that this is an extra dimension to their work. Yes. Bearing in mind these healing powers which you say you possess, don't you think they would be better served if they were regulated, perhaps in the National Health Service? Well, as I said, a lot of our ranks are um, doctors and nurses working with the National Health Service. Um, but then again, when you're talking <coughs> about the National Health Service as such, remember that, for example, um, acupuncture wasn't accepted that long ago. And yet now there's talk of bringing this into the health service. Fringe medicine, in other words. Yes. Yes. Uh, have you ever used your powers uh, to forward your career in any way? Uh, in a constructive way, you know, if you feel that you, that you need to do useful work and that uh, you're being held up by some sort of problem, then, then yes, we would work on that. But, but again, uh, not, not push somebody not out of the job. Not selfishly, no. Can I go back um, to the, the great uh, the ritual? Um, in it, it says that the high priestess declares that, you know, she declares worship unto herself. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Well, the words can, 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 we can, we, can we wait and get the end of the times. question and then go back? Um, it's quoted in the Life and Times of a Modern Witch, the book that both of you wrote. Um, I give you a interpretation of what a role, what the high priestess would say, what the high priest would say, yes, and then again, yes, yes. what the high priest, and what the high priestess was indeed saying was, adore <coughs> me, oh come and no, worship me. No, you're wrong. Remember that she is representing God the Mother, and only for one brief moment, and that is to say that particular statement. She is saying to the people around her, not worship me, not worship Janet Farrah, not even worship me as my spirit. I am just saying the words of God the Mother, the Creator. You know, worship nature, worship, um, worship me, the divine. In other words, not me, she but the divine. She's quoting the goddess. I'm quoting the goddess. But who is the goddess? I mean, she doesn't appear to be mentioned anywhere in the Bible. I've never ever come across anything about a goddess. You don't forget that the, the Bible, um, I'm afraid that the um, Hebrew religion, followed by the Muslim and Christian religions, introduced patriarchy into religion. In the early days. They were very firm about it. In the and early days, she existed alongside God the Father. Do you have proof of that? Mm -hmm. Ask archaeologists, when they started um, delving into the great temple at Jerusalem, they found then, and remember that <coughs> today in the Jewish church you are not allowed statues, they found then statues of God the Father, Jehovah, and his consort, his and bride his consort, and wife. Yeah. Yes. You keep <coughs> talking about coming back to be one with nature and everything, but surely you're far too materialistic to really believe in that. In what I mean, way do you think we're materialistic? Well, you've written books, you've made profits from that, you're living in a tax-free environment. We grow our we're own vegetables, grow our own herbs. We are... Uh, well, that's totally medicine. <laughs> but it surely you should be giving your income back into your craft if you believe in it so much. We do. We should be going out to help other people. We do. We help other people all we can, yes. We don't earn money from that. I am a professional writer, and I've earned my, my, earned my living that way all my life. Um, 17 years ago, I came across a subject that interested me particularly, so I've concentrated on writing about that. <coughs> yes. Um, all jobs that you have quoted today, they all seem to be high-pressure jobs. Would you not agree that their practicing of witchcraft is a hobby or a form of escapism? No, it's not. Being a witch is bloody hard work, to be honest. And, I mean, well, I've used the high-pressure jobs. Two jobs then? Well, we've had everybody in our coven from building site labourers down to grandmas, um, down to shop assistants, you name it, we've had it. Is, are the number of witches actually involved in witchcraft, involved in the covens increasing? Yes. Or is it, yes. is it a dying form of worship? No, no it's it increasing. is increasing. How many people are involved in Nobody witchcraft knows in the British exactly, Isles? Because there is no national or international structure, there's no hierarchy outside the coven. But... Um, We've heard estimates for anything from sort of 30,000 in the British Isles or what have you, and, but nobody really knows. <coughs> but we, we, one uh, pointer that we do have is that we get readers' letters practically every day from our books, you know, from which is that we've never heard of before. This uh, lack of central control in itself must be worrying for you, presumably, <coughs> because lots of people are going to operate as black witches and presumably are going to turn the average member of the public off good witchcraft no, I, no, without no, central think, control or discipline. I no. think mo most um, practicing witches are not black. We find that the, the black ones are a sick fringe, that most covens work um, honestly and they try to work um, white magic 
and they are they keep quiet. One doesn't know about them. The ones that hit the headlines are the ones that do scandalous and bizarre, bizarre things, and we don't regard them as, as real witches at all anyway. They're idiots who've read a few Dennis Wheatley books and set themselves up thinking that this is what witchcraft is, mm, which is another reason why we write on the subject, to clear yeah. the whole matter up. We've had a number of questions in about the relevance of witchcraft as we enter the next century, one especially from <laughs> Catherine Foote. Of what relevance is witchcraft to the British public as we enter the 21st century? I think that the world is going through a change. It's a dramatic change. People are seeking spiritual roots again. A lot of the established religions are not making them happy. They don't want to go to a church on Sunday and approach God that way. They want to say, God, I'm going to speak to you one to one. And this is one of the reasons why it's growing, and this is what its relevance is to the 21st century, that it is growing on such a worldwide scale that we are going to return, in a sense, and I'm going back to Christianity, to the early days of Christianity, when people worshipped in small groups. There was no big somebody up there saying, this is the way it's going to be done. I'm up here dominating you. You're all down there, and you are going to hear what I'm saying. Instead, we are going to... In fact, even in Christianity, I think it will happen. There's going to be a bigger growth of small groups worshipping in private together, and I think this is going to be the saving of Christianity. Another relevance to the, to the 20th century and this particular period of it is that it is, as I said, very much a nature-based, an ecology-based uh, religion, and there's a growing consciousness that we are making a horrible mess of the world we live in, and we've got to do something about it fast, or we'd have blown holes in the ozone layer and gone various uh, irreversible things. And this is another reason why it's very relevant. Now, this Saturday night, children all across the country are going to be celebrating Halloween. I wonder if we could ask you what, what you're going to be doing on Halloween night. OK, Stuart. Um, well, we have a cycle of uh, being nature-based. You know, we have a cycle of eight festivals or eight Sabbaths which uh, celebrate the natural cycle of the year. And this is where we celebrate the end of summer and the beginning of winter. It's the old Celtic New Year. Yeah. Also, it, uh, traditionally, it is a time when the veil between the seen and the unseen is very thin. And this is about the only time when we will ritually invite dead friends to join us if they wish, us, wish to. Basically, and we, we have will a have a, a period of silence while we wait to see what happens. And we've so had on, on Halloween, you literally will call back the dead? No, we no, don't call invite. Them back. You invite back the dead invite. on Halloween's night? Yeah. We have a period of silence to allow them to be their presence, their essence to be with us. Mm. And then, if you like, we say the equivalent of a prayer for them. And afterwards, we turn the whole thing into a wonderful, glorious, very childlike party. Bobbing well, for a... apples the whole bit. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. But in the meantime, Janet and Stuart Farrer, thank you for being open to question.